Romans chapter 8. Let me call your attention. Verse 28, 29, and 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he, that is Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to gather. Lord, thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for the gospel. Father, thank you for calling us to yourself. Thank you that in time we were justified. Father, we look forward to today when faith becomes sight. We make it home. And we see Jesus as he is. And as John tells us, we will be like him. For indeed, we will see him as he is. In his name we pray. Amen. Three of the most encouraging and comforting words that you will ever read in Scripture are the three words, and we know. And we know. Not and we feel. Not and we think. Not and we hope. But and we know. For those who love God, for those who are called according to His purpose, His purpose being to be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus, we know that all things, not just the good things, not just the wonderful things, the fun things, the happy things, but the bad things, the hard things, the tragic things, the nonsensical things that we experience in life, we know that all things work together for that ultimate good, that ultimate purpose. I don't know of a more needed word today than that. I saw last night an encouraging word from a brother pastor who reminded pastors today, pastor, in the times in which we are living and the things in which we are seeing, what your people need today is not your wisdom, nor do they need to be entertained. They need to hear the gospel. They need to be encouraged by the truth of the gospel. So what you're going to get this morning is the greatest of encouragement that is the gospel as we continue to look at this particular passage. How do we know that all things are going to work together for good, good being, how do we know we're going to make it home? How do we know we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ? How do we know that? We know that because we have a plan specifically laid out by Paul. It is an unalterable chain of events. Five links in a chain described by five words by Paul in verses 29 and 30, the verses that follow verse 28. You love Romans 8, 28. I know non-Christians who love Romans 8, 28. They believe that verse tells them it's all going to be good. There's only one problem with that. You have to actually read the verse and pay attention to it because it's not a blanket promise for every human being. It is a promise to those who love God. And apart from Christ, you don't. It is a promise for those who are called according to His purpose. That is, those who have been saved, redeemed in Christ Jesus. Now, we are looking at those five words. That's what we've been looking at for the last several weeks. We're ready for the fourth one. Those he called, he justified. Let's get a running start. Let's hook the train together really quickly. Uh, if you've been here, you've, you've heard these things. If you haven't been here, they're available on our website. I would encourage you to listen to them because I believe what you are hearing here is nothing less than the absolute life-changing, encouraging message of the gospel. It is a message that shows you he, this is how we know it's all going to be good. Link number one is word number one, those he foreknew. That, we see that in Romans eight twenty nine. God's foreknowledge, those he foreknew. God in the past, in eternity past, set his sovereign, gracious, extraordinary love upon those whom he would redeem. The verse says he foreknew, point in time, act in the past. Not he foreknows, ongoing present tense reality. At a time in the past, and Scripture tells us when that time was, from before the foundation of the world, before you even existed. Paul tells us here's the plan that lets us know that everything you go through in life is going to turn out good because it's going to turn out to conform you to Christ. He foreknew you. He set his affection on you. He 
chose you in the past. Secondly, those whom he foreknew, he predestined. That word is a tough word for, for some people, but it shouldn't be. If you look very carefully, those whom he foreknew, he predestined. And Paul tells us what predestined is. Predestined is to be conformed to the image of his son in order that his son, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. In God's sovereignty, he has determined my destiny. And my destiny is to be conformed to the image of his son. I'm to be like Jesus. That means predestination in its simplest understanding means that God has determined my end. And my end is Jesus. And I'll be honest with you, there's nothing more comforting to me than that. There's nothing more encouraging to me than that. To know that regardless of what I go through, bad choices and all, in Christ God uses those to make me more like Jesus and one day I'll actually arrive. Isn't that wonderful? You will not be lost. You cannot fail beyond redemption. Because you've been redeemed. Isn't that wonderful? That's what you need to know today. That's what you need to hear today. Those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. And here's where really the trouble comes for some people in understanding this. Those he predestined, he also called. I told you last week, John Stott, great Anglican uh, Bible scholar, scholar, died a few years ago, made this observation. He said, the call of God is the historical application of his eternal predestination. Basically, what he means is this. In time, God called you, and you responded. Here's the definition of what it means to be called in this Romans 8, 29, and 30 sense. Here's how I defined it last week, and I want to just remind you of this. To be called in this sense means that God overcomes my hatred of him. He overcomes my foolish rebellion against him. And he draws me to Christ by means of the gospel. In doing so, he creates in me both faith in him and love for him where both were previously absent. I previously had a heart of stone. Now I have a heart that beats with love and faith for him. That's what this call does. Now, let me take just a second to make sure you understand something. Your salvation, even your faith, is a gift. It is a gift that comes from God. We often talk about faith being, or or salvation being free. I got news for you. It's not free. Salvation costs the blood of Jesus. It costs. It's not free. It's very costly. You by God's grace, are enabled to believe. He gives you the faith to believe. That is one thing that is going to come through this if you'll see the full picture of the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 9, Paul says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this, not of your own doing, it's the gift of God. Which? The salvation or the grace or the faith? All of it. God's grace is a gift. Faith is a gift. Salvation is a gift, not anything you do, not of work, so that you have no grounds for boasting. Now, here's one thing that seems to me that's absolutely obvious in the New Testament. I told you last week, there, when you look at the, the, the concept of calling in the New Testament, th- there are two distinct ways to see it, two distinct calls that are given to us in the New Testament. One of them I'm calling the undeniable call to follow Jesus. The other is what I'm calling the irresistible call to faith in Jesus. Let me tell you, let me remind you the difference, and then I want to show you an illustration from the life of perhaps the 20th century's greatest Christian apologist. That first one, the, the undeniable call to follow Jesus, is an open invitation to all men everywhere to repent and believe. We preach the gospel to everyone. We proclaim the message of salvation to everyone. Why? Because there's only one way To be saved, there's only one way for sin to be given, and that is through the gospel, through Jesus Christ and what he's done. So we proclaim that message, the undeniable call to repent and believe the gospel. But here's what we learn. If you look and you listen from life experience and from Scripture, the vast majority of people to whom this call is given reject the call. They do not respond to that call. And we're going to find out in eternity the vast majority of people rejected that call. What do you base that on? I base it on a parable Jesus told, parable of the sower. 
sower went out to sow, sowed seed, seeds on four different types of soil, soil. There was response from three of them. One of them, no response at all. And only one of them actually produced fruit. I have always understood that to be, in essence, here's what you should expect. You should expect in the proclamation of the gospel, roughly one in four to actually hear the call that transforms their life. Now, we can argue about that if you want, but you, I believe you see that consistently, not only in the New Testament as Paul's missionary journeys began, but I believe you see it in time. In, in my lifetime as a pastor and sharing the gospel and preaching, everything from street witnessing on the streets of Millington outside the naval base of the 1980s to, the, to today, the proclamation of the gospel for the most part is rejected by the vast majority of people. That call is rejected. And yet, if you look at what Paul is saying in Romans 8, 28, 29, and 30, he tells us there is a call that is not rejected. That call actually results in you being justified and glorified because that call is part of a five-link, unalterable chain of events that you cannot stop. If God foreknows you before the foundation of the world and sets you on the path to be conformed to Jesus, in time you will respond to the gospel, at which point you are justified, which we're going to look at here in just a moment, which guarantees you are glorified, which means you become like him and you actually make it home. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's the undeniable call, the irresistible call. That irresistible call is that saving call of God that you will not reject. I've been asked a number of times through the years, you mean there are people who cannot resist the gospel? That's the wrong question. Here's the question. If the call of the gospel comes to you, why would you reject it? Why would you? If you understand what the call of the gospel is, why would you reject it? Well, the reality is there are some who will not. They cannot because they are part of this process that Paul says we guarantee works together for good. Let me give you an example from somebody in history that when you really understand his life and his story, you, you see, actually see this. You may be uh, familiar with a guy named Clive's Staple Lewis. There's a reason why he called himself Jack. How would you like to go through life with the name Clive's Staple? Sounds like an office supply store, doesn't it? C.S. Lewis is a fascinating individual. You, if you're familiar with him, you know him uh, from uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, or if you are more spiritually mature and advanced, <laughs> you read mere Christianity somewhere along the line. C.S. Lewis was born in 1898 in Northern Ireland. His background is the religious conflict of, the, of Catholic, Protestant, Northern Ireland. However, his mom and dad were both Anglican, Anglican, Church of England. As a child, he was exposed to that and seemed to embrace that faith. At the age of nine, his mother died. In his teens, uh, right after his mother died, his father sent him off, he and his brother off to boarding school in England, where he was exposed to some harsh realities and difficulties. As a teenager. He had completely rejected the gospel. In fact, pronouncing himself to be an atheist. At the age of 17, he wrote to a life, what would prove to be a lifelong friend, Arthur Greaves, at the age of 17, in a letter to him stating basically, yes, I'm an atheist. I find no rational reason to believe there is a God. This is 17-year-old C.S. Lewis. Over the course of the next dozen years, Lewis becomes very educated, associated with Oxford, uh, an expert in Renaissance literature. At the age of 30, finally, he becomes converted. He becomes a Christian. Listen to what he writes in Surprised by Joy. Surprised by Joy, he wrote in the mid-1950s. This is, in essence, a spiritual biography Lewis said all of his life, even as a kid, he remembered the thing he was really looking for was joy, describing joy as it's, it's hard to nail it down, but what he was looking for was a life-changing relationship with the God who created him. That's the joy he's talking about. Listen to his journey. Listen to this. I put this in your notes. I think this is so important because this makes Romans 8, 29, and 30 leap off the page to me. 
particularly if you understand Lewis and his theological bent. He writes, you must picture me alone in that room in Magdalen. Magdalen is a college on the campus of Oxford. Night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. Do you know who he's talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He says, every time I would look up and think for a minute about something other than my work, I could hear Jesus coming, and I didn't want that. What he's saying is, I wasn't looking for Jesus. I wasn't looking for this. Sounds like Paul, doesn't it? That which I greatly feared had last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in, and I admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing, that divine humility which will accept a convert even on such terms. The prodigal son at least walked home on his own feet, but who can duly adore that love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who is brought in kicking, struggling, and resentful, darting his eyes in every direction for a chance of escape. The words compelle entrare, compel them to come in, have been so abused by wicked men that we shudder at them. But properly understood, they plumb the depth of the divine mercy. The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. What Paul is, or what C.S. Lewis is describing there is those he, who he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Link number four. God set his affection on me. God set me on a determined path. In time, the gospel changed my life. Justified. In Jesus, the standard is met. In Jesus, the standard has been met. Those whom he called he also justified. Now, we've already explored justification in quite a lot of detail. Romans chapters 3, 4, and 5, mid-chapter 3 through chapter 5, are all an exposition of the doctrine of justification. Paul brings this word in this link because justification is the heart of it. Justification explains to us the, the nut and bolt of how salvation really works for us, how it is that God can declare us as meeting his standard. That's what justified is all about. Justification is all about. Now, we've already looked at it in a lot of detail. That You've got six months' worth, worth of Sunday sermons from Romans 3, 4, and 5 you, you can go back and look at to, to really get all of this together. What I want to do in looking at it in this particular passage is just to hit some highlights for you, to remind you that when you see this one word here, there is a lot to this word that Paul's already talked about. When, when, ideally, if you absorbed Romans 3, 4, and 5, when you see this word, all of that should come flooding back to you so that when you hear the word, it's more than just a word. You actually hear and see and understand what's going on here. So let's just look at it for just a moment, this concept of being justified. It is part of that, the, the plan that God is working that cannot and will not fail. In fact, justification tells us why it cannot fail. Justification, what, did it, what does it mean to be justified? We use the word sometimes today about people trying to justify their actions give legal sanction to or rhyme and reason for why they do the things they do. Uh, unfortunately, most of the time, our attempts to justify ourselves are really an exercise in futility and ignorance. You got all that? Yeah. Okay, just, just want you to know that. When you try to justify your sin, you don't really realize how ignorant you are. Ignorant of sin and the consequences and the fact that there is no sweeping it under the rug justification explains it to us. To justify means to declare it righteous. To justify means to proclaim that a standard has been met. In this case, the standard that is met is God's standard, which just happens to be perfection, sinless perfection, to be holy. That's what it means to meet the standard of God. 
That's why it's absurd for you to believe that on your own you can ever meet God's standard. Through the years, I've had a number of people tell me, Pastor, I hear what you're saying, but you know what? I think God is an all right, upstanding guy. I think, I think I'll take my chances. I think I'll do all right with him. I'm not that bad. Hmm. Justification is God's declaration that you meet his standard. It's important to understand we are not righteous. We are not righteous. We have no righteousness. The only righteousness we have is self-righteousness, a righteousness determined by our own standard. We can do nothing to meet the standard of God. The standard is met in Christ. It is his righteousness that is accounted to us. The word that Paul uses is imputation, to impute, to put to the account of someone else. Here's how it works. In justification, God acts. It is an act whereby God, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, declares a believing sinner to be righteous on the basis of what Jesus has done, based on who he is and what he's done. That's justification. That's what it means to be justified. And it's the heart of the gospel. It's the heart of of the book of Romans. So what I want to do to kind of remind you of the the importance of justification is to just give you uh, four descriptive statements that help us to understand what it means to be justified. It's it's a word. I mean, it's more than a word. It's it's what absolutely changes the life of a believer. It gives us status to have confidence that when life is over, it's all good. It gives us the confidence to to know that no matter what we go through, for those who love God and are called according to His purpose, all things work for good. So here are those four statements based on the definition that I just gave to you. Statement number one, the source of justification. Where does it come from? The source of justification is the grace of God. That is, justification is purely the grace of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 22 through 24. The end of verse 22 23 and 24 includes a verse that we are very much familiar with, but let's look at more than just those words that we're familiar with. Romans chapter 3, end of verse 22, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. What's the significance of that statement, no difference between Jew and Gentile? In 21st century America, we kind of lose what he's talking about. What he's talking about is all people, regardless of who you are. In Paul's day, there are two people in the world, Jew and Gentile, believer and non-believer people of God and not people of God. There are no racial categories here. There, there are just people categories here. And just by the way, just so everybody knows, there is only one race, period, the human race. There is no differentiation between any of that. Any, we're all one. We're supposed to be one. The reason we have the issues we have is because of sin and the fallenness of, human, of humanity. Christians are to be exemplary in living and understanding there is one race, the human race, we don't see color or category. That's the way it's supposed to be. And here's why that's important. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. It doesn't matter who you are. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So where does that put all people? In deep, finish it. Finish the blank word with however you want to put it in there. In really deep. Everybody. Together. That gives new meaning to we're all in this together. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Prior to this declaration, the lead up to Paul saying this is Romans 3, verses 10 through 18, in which Paul details how bad it is. In fact, that statement, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, is the logical conclusion of what he says beginning in verse 10. And let me remind you that verse 10 through verse 18, Paul is stringing together statements from the Old Testament. He didn't pull any of this from thin air. This is the condition, the universal condition of man from the very beginning. Let me just highlight a couple of things to show you why grace is so important and why apart from God's grace, we're all, uh, well, you know. Verse 10, no one is righteous. No one. 
Not one. I don't know, you know, I work with this guy, and he seems to be a pretty righteous dude. No. None righteous. In case you missed it, Paul repeats himself. Not one. No one, verse 10, seeks God. No one seeks after God. No one's looking for God. Pastor, I'd beg to differ. I can tell you about my journey in which I was looking for God, and I, you know what? I, I just couldn't find him, but I was looking for him. No, you weren't. You're like a number of people that I've experienced through the years who go from church to church to church looking for God, and when they get close to him, they leave before he finds them. <laughs> That's the human condition. And unless God does something to change what you are by constitutional nature, you will continue to do everything you can not to find him while you say you are looking for him. No one, Paul said, seeks God. Verse 12, all have turned away from God. I, I take that as a, a, an exclamation point on you're not good. You don't do good. And I have people object. They say, uh, Pastor, you mean we can't do anything good at all? No, relatively speaking, you can do a lot of good. There are a lot of good things you can do, relatively speaking. But as far as doing good by God's definition of good in the standard of God, you can, you can do nothing. You can do nothing which would merit meeting the standard of God when we talk about good. Good is a very relative word. Good is like the word love today. It's relative. How many times has somebody stood before an altar pledged their eternal undying love in, in sickness and in hell till death do we part, and then two weeks later they decided death has come a lot sooner than they expected. They have no intention of honoring that. Well, wasn't it a good thing to do it? Well, you proved there's no good by the fact that you didn't keep it and hold it. And by the way, apart from Christ, these things that I've just mentioned... Just, just to let you know, let me say this as brashly, boldly, and in your face as I can. Apart from Christ, we don't care. Apart from Christ, we don't care. What do I mean by that? Verse 18, there's no fear of God in their eyes. No fear of God in their eyes. Listen to me. When you do not fear God... You simply don't care about anything. At least you don't care about the ultimate endpoint. You don't care about the ultimate standard. You just don't care. A lot of things that we are seeing in our country right now is the fruit that validates exactly what I'm saying. Because no one is righteous, because they're not actually seeking God, because they've actually turned away from God, because there is no good and there is no fear of God in their eyes, they don't care. Let me tell you something. You better get used to it. We're on the downhill slide of don't care. And we're headed for the bottom. The question then becomes, what will Christians do in that light? I've been thinking a lot about this. And I've just about reached the point to where I'm beginning to believe that God is going to absolutely let this unfold that's the only way we're going to see any kind of spiritual renewal and revival in this country. It's going to take destruction and devastation to shake the foundation of Christians in this life because we are dependent upon and beholding to certain benefits for being a part of this country that we're depending on that rather than God himself. So what if we remove it all? Will we then trust him? If you think your Savior is in the White House, you're mistaken. That's not our Savior. The one coming in November, whoever it may be, will not be the Savior. In fact, we may very well elect the opposite if things continue. Now, I in no means and ways intend to be political in any of this. I'm just wanting you to understand. I think Christians had better wake up. We are living on an assumption, and that assumption is going to wind up proving that it's an assumption. And you know, you've heard the old expression about assuming... We're about to find out what we really have been if we don't understand this. The logical end of the argument here, verse 20 of Romans 3, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law comes consciousness of sin. Rather, it's being confronted with the truth that we find out how bankrupt we really are. The logical end of the argument then becomes this. If you're ever going to meet the standard of God, which is 
His righteousness. If you're ever going to be declared righteous, if you're going to know salvation to be saved, it means that you're absolutely dependent on the grace of God. Absolutely dependent on God's grace. And that's what justification is. In justification, God counts His own righteousness as ours. That is grace. In justification, God does not count my sin against me. That is grace. You put it together. Justification is the declaration to this repentant sinner that my sins are not counted against me and the righteousness of God is counted for me. And that is grace. I'm forgiven. I'm acquitted. I am justified. I am no longer under God's wrath. Now, you want to talk about fairness? Because that's a word that comes up a lot. Uh, what about fair? Let me tell you, what I just told you is not fair. You being justified by the grace of God is not fair. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Don't bring the word fair into the conversation. You don't want fair. You want grace. To be justified is sourced in God's grace. That's the first statement. Second statement, the ground of justification. How is it that justification is even possible? The ground of justification is the work of Christ. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. God, uh, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Again, we often say that salvation is free. It's the free gift of God. Salvation is a gift, but it's not free. It costs the very life of Jesus. How significant is this statement? God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Jesus willingly gave himself to atone, to deal with our sin. He died. He gave his blood, drained for our sin. Why blood? Why, why is that such an issue here? Why is it such a big deal? Why do Christians talk about the cross? Why a bloody cross? Because the fundamental principle of life given in the book of Leviticus is this. Life is in the blood. And sin is an act of death. Sin is the bringing of death. Sin merits death. Why? It's a capital offense because you've sinned against your creator. It's a capital offense. You understand what a capital offense is? A capital offense is one that merits death. Why is it called capital? Because it's held in a capital? No. It comes from the Latin caput, the head. A capital offense is one that takes the head off. Got it? Get it? Got the picture? Capital offense merits execution, and the sense is that of beheading. Very prominent in Roman history, by the way. Romans executed criminals on crosses. They did not execute Roman citizens on crosses. You know how Romans executed Roman citizens? They took their head off. Their head went kaput. Capital punishment. Got it? Good. Sin is a capital punishment. It's a capital offense, rather. Meriting a capital punishment, meaning you deserve death. Jesus met that. His death is the answer for us. Here's, here's the deal. In order to meet the standard of God, sin's debt must be paid. Forgiveness is not pulled out of thin air. God doesn't sweep anything under the rug. He doesn't simply drop the charges. I know we have this nice little sentiment uh, that we're going we're gonna to face judgment and charges are going to be brought against us and Jesus is going to be our defense attorney and he's just going to drop the charges. Now, the charges are not dropped. Charges dropped implies they're not paid for. Guess what? Your sins have been paid for. The debt has been paid. The charges are not simply dropped. The reason you're able to be set free is because the debt has been paid. Jesus paid the debt. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul sums it up. For my sake, he made him, that is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. In him, we become the righteousness of God. So the ground of our justification 
is the obedience of Jesus, obedient even to death. The source is the grace of God. The grounds is the work of Christ. Number three, the means of justification, that is, how do we actually obtain it? The means of justification is faith in Christ. Again, Romans 3.25 into verse 26, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He is just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Verse 25, to be received by faith. Verse 26, those who have faith in Jesus. Faith. Faith is the channel by which justification becomes mine. Faith is the fruit of the call of God, the effectual call of God. Faith. Yes, you have to believe. It is absolutely necessary and essential. But understand, faith is not something you do in and of yourself. Again, faith is a gift from God, and that faith ties you into salvation. Faith is believing what God has done for me, and faith is freely receiving what He offers to me. I like the way John Piper put this. He said, my debt was paid in the death of Christ while I was still helpless and ungodly. The wrath of God against me was appeased and averted, not by my faith, but by the death of Christ while I was still His unbelieving enemy. But only when I surrendered all attempts at self-justification and trusted in Christ alone did I hear and know and delight in the announcement, not guilty. Yes, faith, absolutely essential, absolutely integral. You must have faith. Thank God, faith is something God gives. It's a gift. Salvation's a gift. Grace is a gift. Faith is a gift. It's all of God. Salvation begins and ends with God. We need to hear that today. Believers need to hear that today. More importantly, believers need to believe that today. Lastly, the end of justification. Why this is so important and why justification is the key to all things working together for good. The end of justification is union with Christ. That is, meeting the standard puts us in Christ and unites us with Him. Paul develops that in quite some detail in Romans chapter 5. The ultimate end of being justified by grace through faith in Christ Jesus is that we are united with Him. We are in Christ. Now, here's how Paul does it. In in Romans 5, he draws a parallel between man in his natural state in Adam and man in Christ, the second Adam. You may remember some of this from when we were in Romans chapter 5. I'd encourage you to go back and at least read Romans 5. In Romans chapter 5, listen to what Paul states. This is verse 12, verse 17, and verse 19. In verse 12, Paul says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Now let me remind you what he's saying there. He's not saying just that we all sin, that makes us a sinner. He's saying because of the sin of Adam, we're sinners. In Adam, we all fail, we all sinned. The, ori- the whole concept of original sin, original sin is the sin of Adam that tainted the human race. Again, some people don't like that, and the word is, that's not fair that I be judged by the sin of Adam. Oh, you're not judged by the sin of Adam, you're judged by yours. It's just that you are in Adam, and you do what Adam did. You're always going to. You're in Him. That's what you are. You are fallen. As sin entered the world through one man, death through sin, in this way death came to all people, all people sinned. You know what? I just still don't think that's fair. If you don't like that, then you're not going to like what you're about to hear in verse 17, and eight, uh, verse 17 and 19 because that same principle comes into play with Christ. Verse 17, For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Oh, you mean identified with Adam and I'm condemned, identified with Christ and I'm saved? You got it. You are one with Adam in your fallenness in Christ. You're one with him in redemption. You can't have it only one way. You can't say, I want to be with Christ, and I don't like the in Adam. I want to stand on my own. I don't want the Adam part of it. Well, if you stand on your own, you're worse than Adam. Uh, I've, I've, you ever do any, uh, uh, just 
a little sanctified imagination thinking about how things worked and operated. You ever ask yourself the question, how long did Adam and Eve last before they failed, before they sinned? How, how long were they here before temptation brought them down sin, and they sinned? How, how long? Five minutes? Five days? Five years? We don't know. If it were five minutes, I bet you, you could beat it. <laughs> if they did it in five, I can name that tune in four. I can commit that sin in four. How about you? I'm pretty sure I would have beat them. If it took them five years, I know I could beat them. How long? We don't know. We do not know. But one thing we do know, there has yet to be any one human being who lived who hasn't sinned, save one, the God-man Jesus. Verse 19, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. I haven't quoted Lloyd-Jones in a while, so let me give you a little Lloyd-Jones as we wrap this up. The end of justification being union with Christ and why we need to wrestle with this and understand it. Lloyd-Jones said, nothing so robs us of the joy of salvation and assurance as the failure to realize the full content of justification. Justification is not only forgiveness. That's just preliminary. If you're justified, you're in Christ, incorporated into him, a part of him. And that, as Paul points out, implies and involves our adoption as children of God, sons of God, and all that follows from that. If you'll recall, uh, in Romans chapter 8, before uh, we had to... Before things happened the way they did, back in February, January or February... This concept of adoption is in Romans chapter 8, and I talked about adoption. The New Testament concept of adoption built off the Roman concept of adoption and how an adopted son of Rome actually had more rights than a natural-born son of Rome. It's always shaped my understanding of adoption and really gives life to this concept of being adopted by God. An adopted child... <clears throat> Listen, you're always going to be that child. There's no getting rid of you, even if you want to. Even if I wanted to unadopt one, I would not, I could not. Same way with the spiritual application of Roman law to the Christian description of being adopted children of God. God wouldn't get rid of you. You're his. He chose you, picked you out. I, I don't really know of any situations where a child that was adopted went through the process whereby he had 10 or 12 families to pick out and he picked the ones he wanted. You know, that's not the way adoption works. The way adoption works is they send you or you become aware of a multitude of kids and you make the choice. That helps us to understand salvation a little bit. It's not that God gave you a multitude of options and you pick what you want. He chose you. He foreknew you set you on a path to being conformed to his son. In time he called you, you followed. Repentance and faith demonstrated. He justified you. He declares you meet the standard. Not you, Christ. I see you in Christ. His righteousness is your righteousness. Your sin is put on him. That's good news. And we know, not and we feel, not and we hope, not and we think, and we know. Listen, if you're here today and you know Jesus, you owe your existence here, your election to the unconditional foreknowledge of God. If you are here and you have hope of glory, you have hope because he predestined you to it. If you're here and you've been awakened to faith, you owe it to the grace of God. He called you. If your sins have been acquitted and the righteousness of God belongs to you, you've been justified. You owe it to God's grace. Therefore, you can know it's all good regardless of what comes your way. Father, we thank you this morning for grace. Father, we thank you this morning The Lord, you have worked a plan that began in eternity past and you're continuing to work it today. And regardless of what we might go through today, tomorrow, or, or next week, 
or next year. All things for those who love you and have been called according to your purpose work for good. May we take hope in that, comfort in that. May we know peace because of that. My prayer is for the one today who hears these truths and Father is uncertain, who doesn't know what life holds for them, who doesn't know where this may end. They can know. Father, you're calling. Will they heed and hear the call? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.